So let me give you a little update on Michael and Becca. They have a baby. They had a baby this week. Everybody's healthy and good. Uh, that's what, yeah, you can clap for that. <laughs> and uh, it has been so encouraging for me and exciting for me to watch Michael and Becca grow in their journey, grow in their relationship with Jesus, and to see Becca really over the last year go from being decided to being discipled and really growing in her faith. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. All right, well, let's get started. Let, be honest with me for just a minute. This is church. We've got to be honest. Who is a fan of superhero movies? Come on, safe space. Go ahead. There's lots of nerds here. Yeah, go ahead. All right. My kids and I and my wife, we're all big fans of superhero movies. And it's not enough that we go watch them. We then have to break them apart and tear them down and then fight about which superheroes are best. Let me tell you, my favorite superheroes are the classic superheroes. Superman, Captain America, the guys that are basically Boy Scouts that don't have any character flaws for the most part. They're, you know, generally putting the, the interests of the people that they're to protect first, putting their own interests second. My kids, they like a different kind of superhero. They like, I guess, more complex superheroes that don't always do what they're supposed to do. They don't always do things for the right reason, like Batman or, you know, um, Thor, you know, where sometimes they're pretty selfish and they don't really care that much about the people they're supposed to protect. One of the biggest debates we've had over the last few years is whether or not the character Loki, you know Loki from the Thor movies, whether or not he qualifies as a villain. I'm adamant that he's a villain. My kids are not. We have a disagreement there. You talk about a complex character. That dude, one minute he's like leading an alien army through a wormhole to destroy the earth. The next minute he's fighting right alongside Thor to save their planet. So I believe he is a villain that sometimes does the right thing for the wrong reasons. My youngest daughter believes that he is something called an anti-hero. If you don't know what an anti-hero is, it just means you're less nerdy than my kids are. Well, we're in the second week of our Beyond Belief sermon series where we're going back to the basics of what it means to become a disciple. Last week, we talked a lot about uh, this, these ideas of the five things, and we're going to talk about those again today. But we talked about a big church word called sanctification, and sanctification is the process of becoming a disciple. Or the way we've been saying it over the last few weeks, it is the process of moving from decided to disciple. It comes from the Greek word hagiosmos, which means to be set apart for special use. And that's what we are as followers of Jesus. We're set apart for bringing glory to God, having relationship with God, and doing God's work here on earth. And, and so when we talk about this idea of moving from decided to disciple, here's what we mean. Some of you guys uh, followed, decided to follow Jesus. Maybe that was a few months ago. Maybe it was many years ago. Maybe you've been baptized and you go to church, but it's never really gone any further than that. You've just kind of stuck in this idea of being decided. But the Bible is very clear and Jesus is very clear that that's not where we're to stay. That as we continue to follow Jesus, we're to be sanctified. In other words, we're to move from decided to being his disciple who mirror our lives after him, who look more like him, talk more like him, think more like him, and act more like him. And there aren't any magical formulas for becoming a disciple or becoming more sanctified, but we talked last week about five areas that seem to be pretty core areas that Jesus was very clear as a part of our relationship with him, and the New Testament writers are pretty specific that we're supposed to be growing in these areas. And so these are kind of foundational areas for becoming a disciple set. In other words, the process of sanctification necessarily involves those things. Let's look at those five areas. Consistent prayer, generosity with time and talents, generosity with resources, making and growing disciples, and growing in Bible knowledge. Now today, we're going to focus on the first one, consistent prayer. Consistent prayer is one of the most fundamental parts of having a relationship with Jesus. And, and if you think about it, it just makes perfect sense. Talking is a fundamental connection with any relationship, right? Whether that's a dating relationship, that's with your spouse, that's with your friends or your parents or your children. When we talk to one another, we grow in relationship with one another. We share experiences with one another and the, the connection grows deeper. That same thing works in our relationship with God. The more we talk to him, the deeper our relationship grows. And, and I think one of the best places to look at prayer in the entire Bible is in an Old Testament character that I think who qualifies as a superhero. If I were trying to compare King David to a Marvel superhero, he'd probably be 
more like Iron Man. Because like Iron Man, he has some character flaws. He struggled with pride. He struggled with envy. He struggled with adultery. He had some flaws in his character. He was complex. But what we see about David is when he was focused on God and he was following after God, he did some pretty superhero things. He was one of the great kings of Israel. He was an amazing warrior and leader. He was complex, though. He knew what it was like to be on the top of the world, on the spiritual highs. He knew what it was like to be in the pit of despair. He knew what it was like to have hundreds of people chasing him, trying to kill him. He also knew what it was like to be celebrated and praised and cheered by thousands. He knew what it was like to be betrayed. But he also knew what it was like to betray other people. But despite all of his faults and his failures, the Bible calls King David a man after God's own heart. You know, like any good superhero, David has an origin story. And most of you guys know the origin story of King David. He is a young teenage boy. The, the, uh, Israel is in a, a battle with another country called Philista. Uh, and the Philistines, they're fighting against them. And um, David's too young to fight. But one day his dad says, hey, take some food up to your brothers who are on the front lines uh, with Israel. And so David heads off with some food and he gets to the front lines and he sees this Philistine who walk, just looked like he would have walked straight out of the pages of a comic book. This guy is over nine feet tall. He is big and muscular. He, his, just his armor, the Bible says, weighed 125 pounds. He carried this massive spear. Just the tip of that spear weighed 16 pounds. So there he is, this big muscular villain. That, I mean, again, he could have been a Marvel villain. I mean, he would fit right into that mold. And so David's there, and he kind of steps back, and he's watching to see what uh, Jewish soldier is fixing to step out and go kick this villain's behind, but nobody goes. And, and so David said, you know what? I'll do it. David didn't have armor. He's in a tunic, and, you know, a little short dress looking thing for men back then. He's carrying a staff and a sling. So can you imagine this picture as he's walking out, this huge hulking man in full armor, and there's David with this little sling. But, but you guys know what happened, right? He has five stones. He takes one of those smooth stones. He puts it in a sling, and he slings it, and it hits Goliath right below his helmet, right in the forehead, knocks him unconscious. Then David, because he doesn't have a sword of his own, he goes over and he picks up Goliath's big, huge, heavy sword. I'm sure he just kind of let the weight drop down on his neck and cut his head off. At that point, the entire Philistine army took off running. I think what was going through their minds is, if this is the way their boys fight, we sure don't want to face the men. This is one of the high points of King David's life. But he also had some really low points. Later in his life, one of his sons would actually rape one of his daughters. And then another one of his sons would kill that son about that going on in your family. And, and David struggled with sin. He, he committed the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And to make matters worse, to cover up that sin, he had one of his most loyal servants and soldiers killed in battle. He committed murder, killed Uriah the Hittite. And, and so the question is, how did David get to be a man after God's own heart? He had all these struggles, all these character flaws, and, and committed some big sins in his life. But he's known as a man after God's own heart. So how did this relationship happen? If you look at the book of Psalms, man, it's easy to see. David had a desperation from God that came out of his prayer life. Man, he shared everything with God in prayer. He shared the good times, the bad times. He trusted God when things were down. He trusted God and thanked God even when God didn't do what he asked him to do. And so we get to see that through this prayer life, through his communication with God, he developed this relationship that was deep. And I want to show you just a couple of verses to show you just how deep or how desperate his relationship with God is. Look at this, this is Psalms 42, 1 through 2. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? You can see David's passion for God. Here's another verse, Psalm 66, 63, 1 through 3. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. You see that passion that David has? That's why he's known as a man after God's own heart, because he regularly prayed to God. He regularly sought out God, and he was desperate for that relationship. 
Now, I would love to tell you that I have that same passion for God, where it's like a deer that's been running for a while and comes to a stream and just desperately needs water. And you can see like a dog, too, or pant when they get to the, to the water bowl. I, I can't honestly say that I normally think about my relationship with God in that depth. But what I can say is that prayer is a very regular part of my life. I I pray throughout the day. So like in the morning, usually I'll pray about 20 minutes, and it's a time of my formal prayer when I will, you know, praise God and do different things and pray for the day and spend about 20 minutes in prayer. But that's not the end of my day. Throughout the day, I'll say prayers. So maybe somebody texts me or emails me a prayer request, and I'll pray for that. Or I see something on Facebook, somebody needs some prayer, and I'll pray for that. Or before I go into a meeting or have a conversation that I know is going to be kind of difficult or, or a big deal, I'll pray for that. Our family prays before meals as a regular basis. I, I pray before I go to bed at night. On Sunday mornings before you guys get here, I'm praying that God would take my words that I so often stumble over, so often don't say it exactly the right way, but he would take those words and through his power, he would change lives and he would bring people to him. And so that's kind of what a day of prayer looks like for me. But look, if I'm honest with you, I still don't pray as much as I should. I told you last week, when it comes to sanctification, I'm a work in progress. And I will be a work in progress until the day I die. Here's the challenge. Here is the commandment that drives prayer. Look at at this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you want a deeper relationship, there's the recipe right there. Rejoice always. In other words, rejoice in God, what he's done for you. Be happy in God, joyful in God. Even when you're sad, still be joyful for what God has done. That's prayer. Pray without ceasing. means pray a lot. It should be a regular part of your day. Give thanks in all circumstances. Well, that too is prayer, right? All of this is about praying to God in different ways. And that's a recipe. Talking to God should be as important to you as talking to your spouse, talking to your kids or parents, talking to your best friend, or as David would say, it's as important as water, right? If water is what sustains us physically, prayer is what sustains us spiritually. That's the challenge we have. And so I want to spend the rest of this sermon talking about some different types of prayers that King David prayed. So you can kind of begin to understand the different aspects of prayer and hopefully grow in your prayer life. And I think you're going to learn something new, whether you're just getting started today or you've been praying for a long time, I think you're going to learn some new things from King David about prayer. All right, well, let's look at the first type of prayer. The first type of consistent prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. Now, before we get to the actual prayer that King David did, we need a little background. So at this point in time, there was not a permanent temple in Jerusalem. They had uh, some tents where they would sacrifice and worship God and call the tabernacle. And so King David wants to build this beautiful, big temple in the city of Jerusalem. And so he asked God, can I build this temple for you? And God says, no. (laughs) I'm going to let your son Solomon, when he becomes king, and after you're dead, he's going to build the temple. And he tells David why. He says, your hands are bloody from all the wars you fought and all the different battles that you've been in. Now, we said that King David is, a, is kind of a complex character. He had an ego issue at times. So David could have reacted poorly to this, but he doesn't. In this moment where he doesn't get exactly what he wants, he says this beautiful prayer of thanksgiving to God. Let's look at that together in 2 Samuel 7, 18 through 22. Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant and this decree that his son's going to get to build the temple. Sovereign Lord, is, is a, this is for a mere human being. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, sovereign Lord. For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you and there is no God but you as we have heard with our own eyes. David gives thanks in all circumstances. He is thanking God even though he didn't get exactly what he asked for. And this is a great lesson for for us. We need to constantly pray this prayer of thanksgiving. It ought to just fill our lives. We need to pray for the big gifts that we have from God. Every morning I pray that and thank God that Jesus died for me, 
for my sins. I thank him for another day of life. I thank him for my health. I thank him for my family. And I thank him that I get to serve him and that he's allowed me that opportunity. Those are five big things that I pray for almost every day. Those are big things for you too. We're not guaranteed health. And at some point, our health for most of us is going to fail. We're not guaranteed another day of this life or another day with our families. And so those are big things that we should be giving thanks for. And if that's not something you're doing, that's an easy way to grow in your prayer life. Start praying for these huge gifts that God gave you. Write them down. Sit down and just make a list of the big gifts in your life. And then just take time every day to say a prayer for that. We need to say a prayer for big gifts in our life, but we also need to pray for little things. When you see a beautiful sunset, give thanks. You know, when I got to see the total eclipse, even though there's cloud cover and I didn't actually get to see it, it got dark as night all of a sudden at 1.13 or whatever it was in the middle of the day. I stopped and I just gave thanks to God for that moment. That we worship a God who is powerful enough that his creation can turn at night in the middle of the day. Think about a good meal. Give thanks for a good meal. Think about this. God did not have to make the food that nourishes us taste good. He didn't have to. But he did. That's a blessing from God. That is a little gift from God that we get to enjoy that. My, one of my favorite foods is steak. Like, I like steak so many different ways. I like it just a little butter and maybe a little salt and pepper. I also like it wrapped up in a tortilla with some, some onion and bell pepper and some salsa on it. I, I love steak. But look at a cow. A cow does not look like it should taste good. You know, you watch a cow, it just doesn't. But God made a cow taste good. That, that's a blessing from God. Now, think about an even better food from an even nastier animal. Bacon is a gift from God. That's a miracle if you think about it. Bacon comes from a filthy pig that wallows around in the mud that you pour slop on its head. It stinks, and out of that comes bacon, one of the most amazing gifts of God ever, right? Now, (laughs) there we go. That's what it takes to get an amen around here is talk about bacon. (laughs) Jesus and bacon. Let's just stay focused on that. Now, but I got to be transparent with you. I think God did mess up when it came to Brussels sprouts. I I, I cannot defend him there, except I will say this. I don't think God made Brussels sprouts to be food for us. He made Brussels sprouts to be food for our food. Think about that for a minute. But those little nasty things, you can even wrap them in bacon, and they still taste nasty. That tells you how bad they are. (laughs) One of the easiest ways for us to improve our communication with God is to move beyond the gift to the giver. You did that in your life, probably, if you've actually matured as an adult at some point. Like when you were little and you got a gift at Christmas or for your birthday, what'd you do? You tore that gift up, ripped it all out, the card went flying, you have no idea where it went. You were just hoping the present wasn't from Aunt Edna because she always sent stuff that you didn't understand and you didn't like, but you lost the card or you didn't ever see who gave it to you. And then your mom would say, hey, who's that from? I don't know, right? But I did that as a kid. And finally, as I became an adult and matured about 10 years ago, I start now where I read the card first because I want to know who the giver of the gift is. Then I can appreciate the giver as I open the gift. That's because I've matured, hopefully, in some ways as an adult. But we should be maturing in sanctification by doing the same thing with God. Does that make sense? We move beyond the gifts that he gives to the giver, and we thank him for that. There there are so many little gifts from God that we experience. Lunch with friends, a church we love, a day at the lake, sex in your marriage, a day off from work, air conditioning in Houston. Think about how big a gift that is. The list goes on and on. As you experience those moments, stop, take a minute to thank God. This is a prayer. Thank you, God, that I got to go fishing today. That's a prayer. That's what it means to be praying unceasingly or pray without stop. Now, the bigger challenge from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 is to give thanks in all circumstances. That's the tough part. When you want something to go a certain way, you prayed for it to go that way, and it doesn't go that way, how do you do that? How do you give thanks to God? Let me share from my own life. I have prayed countless times for my wife to be healed from lupus for God to take that away. At this point, I know that's not his plan. He is not going to do that. I give thanks to God now for the medicines that reduce her swelling and reduce her pain. 
I thank God that despite the fact that she hurts a lot, she runs circles around me when it comes to serving God. She takes care of our family way beyond what I could ever expect or hope, and I give thanks to God for that. I give thanks to God that I get another day with her because that's not guaranteed. That's what it looks like to give thanks in all circumstances. We should be praying for the big gifts in our lives and giving God thanks. The little gifts give him thanks, even giving him thanks for the things that don't go the way we hoped or planned. All right, another type of prayer we see from King David was a prayer for direction. So before David would make a big decision, he would pray to God and and ask what he should do. Keep in mind, King David made decisions that affected millions of people, like whether to go to war or not. And and so I want to show you one example of one of these prayers for direction in 1 Samuel 23, 1 through 2. It says, when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are looting the threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, go, attack the Philistines and save Keilah. That's a pretty simple prayer for direction right there. He prays and says, God, should I go attack the Philistines? And God says, go get them. Now, I wish God talked to me that clearly and that conversationally, right? But David was a man after God's own heart, and he wrote part of the the Old Testament. He is uh, in a different place than we are. So God doesn't usually talk to me in clear words. Sometimes he does, but it's not the norm, and it probably won't be. I'm getting ready to make a big decision or go into some difficult meeting or conversation. I'll, I'll take a few minutes, and I'll pray to God, asking for his wisdom and guidance and ask for direction as I go into this decision or or issue. And so often I see God's hand in what happens. You know, one of the things that I rely on every single day is a verse in James. It's James 1.5. It says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And I love this verse. It is a promise from God that says, if you lack wisdom, that's me, that's you, You ask God, and not only does he say he'll give us wisdom, but he says he won't make us feel bad that we didn't know it without his help. I love that. I rely on this every single day. In my morning prayer, I almost always ask for wisdom from God for the day. I'll ask for wisdom as a husband and a father and a pastor and an attorney and a Christian and a leader. And then I trust that God will fulfill that promise and give me wisdom throughout the day. But if I'm going into a big meeting or I'm going into some difficult situation, I stop and again, I use that verse and I pray for wisdom. And so often I see God's hand in what happens. And and that's my challenge for you. Rely on this. This is a promise. God is offering this to you. Take him up on that. You may not be king of Israel, but you're a leader in your home. You ought to be trying to be a leader in your church and in your community. Other people are affected by your decisions. So when you get ready to make a decision or get ready for a difficult conversation, take God up on this promise and then see God's hand in the decision and watch as it unfolds how you can tell God's involvement in what happened. I wish God would answer me as directly as he does David, but that's probably not how it's going to happen most of the time for me and it's probably not how it's going to happen most for you. But I think Christians are more likely to go to Google and ask for advice than to go to God and ask for advice. And that is a huge mistake. Google cannot give you wisdom. Google can give you knowledge. It can give you raw data. It can give you information. But it can't tell you what to do with that information. That's where wisdom comes in. Wisdom takes that knowledge and then applies it in the situation in your life. All right, here's the next prayer we see from David. It's a prayer that we should all pray on a pretty regular basis. It's a prayer of repentance. We talked about this earlier that David committed some pretty big sins in his life. And he made some major mistakes in his life. But I love that when King David was convicted of his sin, man, he goes to God and you can just see the the burden of his heart and how he's just giving that to God. Look at one of those in Psalm 51, 1 through 4. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. This is a prayer that David said after uh, Nathan the prophet con- convicted him and confronted him over his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah the Hittite. 
And, and David cries out to God and repents of his sin. But I love something else that David does in this prayer that we so often do. He says, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. That's pretty tough. We don't really do that very often. We want God to protect us from the consequences of our own sin. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody that, that committed adultery, that cheated on their spouse, and then they're angry at God that their marriage is failing or that they're getting a divorce. And, and they want God to just wave a magic wand and fix all the consequences of their sin. But David doesn't do that. David says, your judgment is righteous and good. There are consequences of our sin. There's judgment for our sin. And those judgments are right and just because God is right and just. And so we see that in this prayer. The next type of prayer we should pray from David is a, a prayer of deliverance. Now, a prayer of deliverance, and I kind of combined a couple of, some of you may wonder what I've done, but I've combined a couple of different types of prayer into this prayer of deliverance. There's two parts to this. The first is you're in a difficult situation. Things are bad, whether that's health for you, health for a family member, maybe things are bad at work or in your marriage or with your kids, and you want something drastic. You want a change of your circumstances. You pray a prayer of deliverance. A prayer of deliverance is also, though, just a prayer for God to show up in power and change the circumstances. Like our church has been praying for a couple of months, well, about three months now, really desperately for God to make us a people who are more passionate for him and to be burdened for the lost around us. That's also a prayer of deliverance. And, and so I want to challenge you to pray prayers of deliverance regularly. But I also want to challenge you not to just pray prayers of deliverance. I think that's, for a lot of us, that's the only prayer we ever pray is when we get in trouble, God bail us out. But, but that's a prayer of deliverance. And I want to show you one from King David. This is Psalm 69, 1 through 4. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters, the floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fell looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs on my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. Now, we don't know exactly what David was experiencing when he said this prayer, but it must have been something pretty significant, right? He's crying out to God for his circumstances to be changed. And God wants us to come to him with our problems. He wants to, us to come to him with, it, with our troubles and the things that we want to see different in our lives. In, in, in fact, he actually shows us what it looks like to come to him and to make these kinds of prayers. Look at Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, uh-oh, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We see that thanksgiving in all circumstances again. But the Apostle Paul here is telling us that the way we pray these prayers is we don't worry. We're not anxious. That's tough. It's tough for me. I'm a worrier at heart. I'm a control freak. So whenever anything's not going my, the way I want it, I worry about that. But Paul is telling us and God is telling us that we're to give that to God. We're to thank him that we even get to be in this situation. When I have a problem with my children, I try to thank God that I have children because so many people don't, Right? but we need to cry out to God. Look, I'd also encourage you to have other Christians in our church pray for you. We have a prayer team. We have elders. If you need some prayer at the invitation time, I'll be in the back. I'd love to pray with you. But you can also just find an elder, find somebody and ask them to pray with you. You can take a connect card that's either in your seat or in the seat next to you, and you can put, there's a place for prayer requests. Write that on that. We pray for every one of those, and you'll get prayed for. We want to be a people who pray desperately for one another. If you get here early before first service, you'll see a member of our prayer team here praying with the entire praise team and the pastors, praying for you guys and praying for our service that God would show up through his power. The Bible is clear that when God's people pray, God shows up. That's just the way it works. Listen to James 5, 16. This is the half-brother of Jesus, and he says, Therefore, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Saying if, if we're righteous and we pray, that has a powerful effect. But you know what? Over the last couple of months, I've actually gotten a deeper understanding of, of this verse that has really changed the way I pray. 
back in January, I was doing a Greek word study on this verse, and I looked at the word prayer that's used there, and I saw that it's a pretty unique word. So the, the word pray or prayer is used almost 300 times in the New Testament. When I saw that, that didn't surprise me at all. There's prayers all the way through the New Testament. But what I didn't know is that there are actually three different Greek words that are used for prayer or pray. And the word that's used here is a word that's only used 18 times in 16 verses. So it's not a very regularly used word. The Greek word that's used here for prayer is a word called deesis. And deesis is a very specific kind of prayer. It's a prayer for something very important. It's a prayer that is passionate and urgent and desperate, filled with emotion. And, and so if you think about the meaning of this verse and you put the Greek word back into it, the urgent prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Your prayers for deliverance don't have to be long. They don't have to be correctly worded, but they have to be urgent. They need to be filled with desperation. This has changed the way that I pray. It's changed the way I even pray for people on Facebook. Used to, when I'd get a request for some prayer on Facebook, I'd say, God, help their family, let them, you know, have peace going through this, and I'd say, I just prayed for you. Okay, but I didn't pray with deesis, and so now before I say I prayed for you, I try to stop, and I pray with some urgency that God would step into that situation. So if I want my prayers for this church to be effective, I got to do more than just try to live the right way. I've got to then pray that God would show up, and I've got to be passionate and urgent about the way that I pray. And so I've tried to do that. It's one of the reasons why we started praying differently as a church back in January, and we've been praying differently as a church all the way up to this point. It's why we've had Wednesday night prayer meetings where we have fasted during the, the, during the day. And we've asked you to fast, or some of you guys to fast and show up with us, and then we pray desperately together in the evening that God would change us, that God would transform us into a people who are passionate for him. I I know a lot of you guys have done that. Even for some of you that couldn't make it, I know you were doing those prayers. We had a 21 days of prayer going into Easter, and I know a lot of you prayed those prayers. Our community groups are praying different. Our staff is praying differently with more urgency and passion. Man, and God is showing up. God is, let me tell you just some little stories. I'm aware of a number of people who have not been in church in a long time who are back in church, some of them serving. And this is all over the last few weeks. I'm aware of some marriages that are in a dramatically different place for the better over the last few weeks. I don't know if you've been in our worship services for long. I don't know about you, but I can feel the presence of God differently the last few weeks than I could before. We've been praying for God to show up with passion and urgency, and he's doing that. Let me give you another example of that. So several weeks ago, we scheduled the third anniversary to be a baptism Sunday. And so that was the last week, and you saw some of the baptisms. Uh, they're more scheduled. But the week before was Easter. And so going into Easter Sunday, we had one person uh, scheduled for baptism. And I was excited about that, but obviously I want more than that. And so, man, it's Easter Sunday. I'm, I'm set up to uh, preach the gospel. So, you know, man, I preach the gospel of Jesus, the death, the burial, the resurrection, how that 2,000-year-old story can still change our life today. And then I gave a pretty passionate call for people to come back and to talk to me about following Jesus and being baptized. First service, nobody comes back to, to talk about that. Second service, nobody. At the end of invitation, second hour, and while we were still singing, I came back down and I knelt at the front of this stage and I had tears just running down my face. And I said, God, you, you tell me that if I pray in your will, and I pray with passion and urgency, that you'll show up. I know you're going to do something amazing. I trust you, God. I know this is your plan. And I got up, and I wasn't worried about it at all. Went back to my seat, and then five minutes later, I walked out of the service, and as I walked out those doors, somebody walked to me, up to me and said, we got five baptisms next week. I got home that day, I was kicked back in my recliner trying to recover from a great Easter service, and I got a text from a guy in our church saying he and his wife want to be baptized in May. They're going to be traveling some, but they want to be baptized. When we pray with urgency and expectation, God shows up. There are big prayers for deliverance. There are small prayers for deliverance that we ought to just pray every day, that that God would improve a relationship that's bad. Maybe that's a relationship with your spouse or with your kids, or your parents, or with a friend. Maybe you need to pray 
pray that God would give you an opportunity to share your faith with that person that just never seems like the right time that he would change that circumstance for you. We need to keep praying that God will move in our church, that he will move in our hearts and we'll become a people that are desperate for him. We'll be a praying church, a church that has passion. And so I want to challenge you to pray this prayer of deliverance, but I also want to challenge you to not just pray prayers of deliverance. The last type of prayer from King David that I have time to talk about today is a prayer of praise. So a prayer of praise is different than a prayer of thanksgiving. Prayer of thanksgiving, you're thanking God for what God has done for you. A prayer of praise is not thanking him for what he's done, it's just praising him for who he is. Does that make sense? So every morning in my prayer time, I try to start with a time of praise, where I just praise God for his power and his wisdom, his mercy, his grace, his love. I praise him for a universe that is so complex and amazing that I can't even begin to understand it. And and that's what a prayer of praise looks like. It is giving him glory. And I want to show you Paul's, one of his many prayers of praise. This is Psalm 103, 1 through 6. You may have seen this even or heard this sung in a song, similar words. Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sin and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. It's just this praising God for who he is, not what he's done, because he is worthy of our praise. So as a reminder, here are the five different types of prayers. Prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of direction, prayer of repentance, prayer of deliverance, and prayers of praise. Prayer shouldn't be something that intimidate us or scare us or cause us to to, to worry. They're just simple talking to God and then listening for his still, small voice. Your prayers don't have to be eloquent or long. God just wants you to talk to him because we all know that every good relationship starts with good communication. So I'm going to ask you to do something a little different as we close today. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes, and then I'm going to let you hear from Becca Miller that you heard talking earlier. It's by video because she's got a brand new baby. She's going to pray for our church to grow in this area of prayer. And as you're praying with her, I want you to hear just how simple her prayer is. There's no pretense. She's not trying to make you think she's a great prayer warrior. She's just talking to God like he's her friend and father because that's what he is. Check this out. Dear God, dear Jesus, you're awesome. I want to let you know that first because you need to know that. And we're here because we are here to serve you and to praise you. We, as a church for Cure City, I specifically praying that, you know, that everyone else is praying that people learn to pray honestly you know instead of fluffing it up and making it this big ordeal you know just really coming down to themselves 100 percent raw and real and really just talking to you and i just want the people of care city to know and understand that it doesn't have to be this big event it doesn't have to be the right moment or the right place or the right outfit it's just us and you lord and We know you're awesome, we know you're great, and we know you do all the things you say you do, and we just want to lean on you as you're our friend, if you're our leader, and that you're here to listen to all of our problems, our whines, our happiness, whatever we got to offer. And so I pray that Care City comes together in honesty, vulnerability, and also also consistency in prayer with you, Lord. And... You're awesome and we love you forever. Amen.